And we're happy to welcome back to these parts, after many, many years, Gary Michael Dalt, the writer and critic. So nice to see you again. Thank you. The uh, producer of this segment, Judy Brake, thought it would be a great idea to start with a poem. So I'm going to read a short poem, just to get us into the spirit of things. Mm -hmm. Emily Dickinson, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. <laughs> Can the fear of dying be a creative force in your experience? Oh, absolutely. You've um, seen it. Yeah, I have seen it. I have felt it. I've seen it all around me. It impels people to do things. They, uh, they wake up sometime in uh, middle age and they think, you know, I don't have a whole lot of time left to do whatever the, thing, whatever the things are that I want to do. And these always get more numerous, by the way, as you get older. Uh, for some perverse reason, when you're young, you only want to do maybe a couple of things. But when you get older, you want to do everything and you have less time to do it. Hmm. Your relationship with the Canadian artist David Balduke. He's now in a hospital in Belleville in serious condition. Uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, David is ill. He, David's very ill. Um, I've known David for 40 years. Uh, he's been painting beautifully for 40 years. But he painted in a certain way that was rather conventionally his. You know what I mean? His paintings tended to follow a certain format. They had a kind of vertical uh, bar or member up the middle. And uh, there was quality there, but a kind of predictability. Then a strange thing happened. You know, last summer, they have, he and his wife have a summer house in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. Last summer, um, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor, uh, and it was operated upon in St. John's. Uh, he was immediately uh, started into a system of uh, treatment of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. He came back to Toronto in the fall, feeling very unwell. And uh, when other people who have experienced this kind of uh, ordeal uh, sit in a chair and, uh, you know, feel awful, uh, David, by some, in some miraculous way, with a huge burst of titanic energy, set about to make about 40 huge pictures, some hmm. of them as big as 8 by 10 feet. So it inspired the, him. The best pictures of his entire career. Hmm. And had a show recently that just closed in Toronto not long ago. Everybody thinks so, including me, but the best pictures ever. You know, I don't want to use this morbid... Um, image very much, but I'll use it anyway. It was sort of like uh, the thing about the candle flaming brightly just before it goes out. Not mm. that I hope David's going to go out, but he is terribly ill. But he had, whatever the reasons, he had this enormous titanic outburst of creativity, uh, making the best pictures ever of his entire life. Well, you say whatever the reasons, but I'm, I'm curious. What do you think those reasons are? What would explain that? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, think, I think partly he knew he wasn't well, and I think he had uh, a clear, lucid understanding of how he might not have forever to do the things he wanted to do. The pictures before he got ill had begun to change. That vertical thing up the center had begun to leaf out and flower out a little bit. But now it burst out like a burning bush. Uh, it, it, it leafed out uh, like Bernini's Daphne. The stars, the, the sky got covered with luminous stars. Uh, the pictures uh, took on a cosmic quality that was really very peculiar. <laughs> and everybody felt it. Do you think, I mean, you've seen so many over the years, so you're the right person to ask this for. Do you think creative people create in part because it allows them to achieve a kind of immortality? Their stuff survives forever. Uh, yeah, I think for sure. Um, we, don't, we don't want mortality in the sort of starchy marble sculpture sort of sense, most of us, I guess. But I think people are keen to leave behind them, desperate maybe, to leave behind them some evidence of their being, so, uh, poems, prose, novels, pictures, things that speak for them, things that are still expressive about them. Uh, you know, when I look at a picture uh, by my dear and much lamented friend Harold Town, I can't believe Harold died 20 years ago. I still miss him desperately. When I look at a picture of Harold's, I can feel Harold's hand at work. I can feel the brush stroking. I can feel it. I can hear his voice. I can. I know what he would say about it. You know, it's interesting because a couple of months ago, just on the other side of the studio over there, we had five authors all nominated for the Charles Taylor Prize. Mm -hmm. So good authors with good work. Mm -hmm. And I put what I just said to all of them. I mean, part of the reason you write, surely, is because you want to be able to leave something on the shelves behind that will last longer than you. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Pshaw. Not at all true. They really? all four sw swore up and down it wasn't true. And I, think I, and they, I told them all they were liars. I, I think they were. I, I think they were not being honest with themselves. I think they foreswore that attitude because they thought it was sentimental. But I'm too old to care about sentimentality. <laughs> I'm going to feel what I'm going to feel, you know. And I know perfectly well, I agree with dear Harold, that, you know, he, Harold was always quoting Matisse who said, art is a priesthood and I, I paint in order to be immortal. And uh, it's not that it's the first item on your agenda uh, when you're an artist, but I think nobody who's being realistic with themselves uh, cannot help but feel that they're doing their very best work and that work will live you know, after them. Where do you think Harold's 
serendipitous attitude about death came from? Oh, I think partly in his case, we're going to skew the program in a different way if we really follow this through. Because, you know, in Harold's case, Harold had a big luminous period of enormous success in the early 60s. And then that, that eluded him forever. Uh, and while he had another 40 years to live and work, uh, nobody ever cared much about Harold after that period of... Uh, say, 59 to 65, mm. which was a period where he couldn't do anything wrong. Right. And I think he felt under-acknowledged. And uh, so I think he felt, well, if I'm not being made much of, if I'm not a, a larger-than-life culture hero uh, in, as I live and work, uh, then I'm going to make so much. I'm going to do so much and be so mercurial and so unstoppably brilliant in his estimation mm. that I'll leave this uh, you know, legacy after me that nobody will be able to ignore. Hmm. How about uh, old age? Does old age play a role in, in um, I, I just, you know, you think of artists like Doris McCarthy who all of a sudden at, at a very late stage in life just blasts onto the scene. That's right. You well, wonder where Dor that comes from. Doris refuses to acknowledge anything like the phrase, the phrase old age doesn't, is a contradiction in terms to her. <laughs> the phrase doesn't mean anything to Doris. She's, she's never going to die. She's 100 or something, isn't she? Mm -hmm. I was very close to uh, a man who was almost a father to me, uh, a German, a German scholar, Barker Fairley, who became a painter later in his life. He was a friend of the group of seven. Barker lived till he was about uh, two weeks short of his 100th birthday. Mm. And uh, I mean, uh, while his senses were disappearing, he used to say people would come up to him and say, oh, Professor Fairley, how lovely to be as old as you are. And he'd say to me, there's nothing lovely about it. I can't taste anything. I can't hear anything. I can't see anything. But nevertheless, you know, he kept on painting. And that's mm -hmm. important. Yeah. 20 years ago, did Harold talk to you about his anticipation of death? And, and maybe similarly today, does David Balduke talk to you about his concerns in that department? No, um, David, neither David nor Harold ever talked about the act of dying. They both talked about um, doing all the work they could do before it was over. But neither of them, you know, when Harold uh, died of cancer as well, um, um, they didn't talk about the, the biological act of dying. They talked about working up a huge mass of the best things they could do before it was too late. I mean, too late, I suppose, means dying. Right. We don't even like to say the word. We say passed away. Mm. I think passed away is silly. It's, it's like, you know, ghosts on Halloween. <laughs> no, we don't pass away. We die. That may explain Woody Allen's line, which is the best line I think I've ever about heard. About not wanting to be there? Well, about, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality by not dying. <laughs> <laughs> he also said, I don't mind dying. I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the market cornered on the good lines on this. Yeah. Uh, all right, sorry to bring us back down again here, but that is the nature of our discussion no, this week. No, it's all right. You recently experienced the death of another friend, the artist and photographer whose work yeah. is beside you here. Yeah, this is Volker, Volker setting. Volker's setting. Volker and I did a book together um, called Captive. It's, uh, it was a book of Volk Volker's zoo photographs. He went all over the world photographing animals in zoos, and I provided a sort of uh, poetic prose text to it. Um, but he did not... You, you did not see his death coming down the road in a way no, that you might have I mean, I don't, mind, I, didn't, I don't mean to whine or complain, but in the last couple of years, I'm surrounded by people, good friends and collaborators, who are dying or who died. And it makes me feel very peculiar. Uh, Volker and I would sit in a coffee shop we frequented, and one day he said to me, uh, we were in the midst of working on this, he said to me, you know, I don't feel very well. And, uh, but he said it's nothing. Six weeks later, he had died of kidney cancer. Hmm. Uh, now, look, I know these things happen. As you get older, I understand nobody gets out alive, as Jim Morrison said. Actually, somebody else said it. But, um, and I guess we all have to sort of find a way out of this life somehow. And I'm not being immature about this. But still, it gives you pause to see your best friends hmm. dying and failing. Let's see some of his work. Michael, can we bring up this? We have some of the... Uh Oh, you have Images. Volker's work. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah I mean, this Volker is from his last show at the Stephen Bulger Gallery. Stephen Bulger Gallery, right? That's right. Yeah, um, Volker was a tireless traveler um, and um, went all over the world in pursuit of his various subjects. His last subject was animals and zoos, and these were not pretty photographs. They were exquisite photographs. Don't misunderstand mm -hmm. me. But they were about captivity. They were about thwarting. They were about they were about circumscribing. They were not about beauty. Oh, isn't the, isn't the animal lovely? It wasn't about lovely animals. It was about uh, do we really, should we really treat people like that? I mean, are, what are cages? What is confinement? Are we not, in a sense, confined? Are we not even confined in the 70 or 80 years we have before we're released by death? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we're all in cages all the time. I wonder, I mean, I'm inferring from your comments that because his death came unexpectedly and much more swiftly than either one of you would have anticipated, yeah. that that uh, is more emotionally difficult to deal with than a death 
that you maybe have a couple of years to get accustomed to. Is that fair to you say? Mean, you mean for him yeah. or for someone well, like for me, you. like I'm one looking, of his friends? Yeah, I'm looking it at you. It happened so quickly, uh, there was no time to deal with it. I mean, he was well and then he was dead. Um, it was much worse. It's much worse for me that my best friend in the whole world, David Balduk, is suffering greatly mm -hmm. and uh, having achieved, a, you know, made a monumental contribution to Canadian painting. Uh, he doesn't deserve that. You know, we are all the victims of being, we're, we're terrible, we're, we, we are terribly flawed in our design. We're designed all wrong. It's, it's, it, you know, there's no point at all in our, you know, starting off dumb and silly and being goofy adolescents, uh, attaining some kind of wisdom eventually, just in time to die. I mean, that's kind of silly. I think it should be it's all the other way around. We should be incredibly bright children <laughs> and they get stupid and goofy as we get older. It's a bad joke, isn't it? And, well, it, it wasn't meant to be, but yeah, it is. <laughs> well, having said that, do you think people who have, uh, and I don't know how many you know, who are spiritual or who have religion, are they, in your experience, more prepared to die? Oh, I don't know if anybody's prepared to die. The lucky people, I suppose, are the people who just get tired, and therefore they see death as a sort of rest. So people still feel that way. They just get tired. Hmm. Um, I know lots of people who are spiritual but not religious. I mean, I think as you get older, you get spiritual but not religious necessarily. Uh, that is, you begin to look more deeply into the meaning of everything. I don't know about you, because you're a young man, but I am a lot older than you are, and I've begun to see great beauty and joy in the simplest things, you know, the smallest thing, a glass of water with ice cubes tinkling, and it strikes me as enormously, overwhelmingly beautiful. That, that would never have happened to me when I was 23. That's a beautiful thing, because Rob Buckman was on this program a couple of days ago saying that the thing that keeps you young is the twinkle. The twinkle in your eye, and if you are still able to be fascinated by the ice in that glass, that speaks well. Maybe, but you know you only have the twinkle in your eye when you're well. As soon as you're mm -hmm. sick, and you know how fragile we are? If our temperature rises at 2 degrees or sinks 3 degrees, we're screwed. I mean, we, we, we live in these fragile little envelopes of good health and well-being. And if anything comes to impinge upon that little envelope of, of good health and well-being, we suffer, and we don't have a twinkle in our eye anymore because we're hurting. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you know people, though, who welcome the death? You said the, a moment ago that, you know, when you get tired, you've had enough. You, Barker, you know Barker, was, Barker was tired. I've, mm -hmm. I've had a couple of friends who said they, 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 they didn't, didn't mind the idea. They weren't afraid of it. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, it's being not afraid of it. Is that the same as welcoming it? Almost. Mm -hmm. You think it's, about it? Sure. All the time. How old are you? You're not old enough to think no, about I'm this not stuff yet. Tell, you know, I'm not going to tell you how old I am. And you know why? Because there is in this culture a s sordid, morbid, stalking ageism. Mm -hmm. And I am a freelance person. And if I say on this program how old I am, there are going to be people out there, people that neither you nor I would respect, who will not want me to write for them something for them because I'm too old. They'll want some you know, boppy 23-year-old. And I mean, I, obviously, I'm. We know, you know you're not a boppy 23 year old. Yeah, we know that. But I, I, I can't bring myself to say the obscene digits. <laughs> Do you mind awfully? I don't mind. No, not at all. Not when no. you've explained it that way. <laughs> but, but presumably, you're. Uh, you got more yesterdays than tomorrow's. So at some point, I you've, do, yeah. you've thought about. Sure. How this is all going to go down? Yeah, that's true. Does it frighten you? It, uh, of course. It frightens me all the time, sometimes in the middle of the night when I lie awake looking at the ceiling. I'm married to a young and beautiful uh, wife who seems ridiculously devoted to me, and she uh, claims <laughs> that she's a great help in this matter, and I think she is, uh, and she gets impatient with me when I get morbid and uh, reflexive about uh, the end of things. She doesn't like me to say things like, geez, I, maybe I've only got 10 or 15 years of you know, creativity left. Uh, she just drives her crazy. Um, and I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> How many years uh, between the two of you? 23. 23? Yes, I know. Good job. Yeah, that's what I think, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you're fine. In many spheres... That's what my doctor said. I went to my doctor, and yeah. I was whining about getting older, and he said, look, I've got a patient who came in here the other day. He's 92 years old. He says to me, Doctor, I want to ask you a serious question. And the doctor says, sure, ask. He says, look, I just bought a computer, and I want you to tell me at the age of 92, whether I should get the two-year warranty or the five-year warranty. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. And the doctor said, get the five-year warranty. And he <laughs> said to me, will you stop whining? He said, look at you. You're fine. He said, why don't you just assume you're going to be 100 years old unless you get run over by a streetcar? I mean, you know, there's no reason to... It's almost like welcoming ill health into your life to keep talking about it mm -hmm. all the time. So let's not. Exactly. Yeah. Let's you, not. In, in many spheres, I think it's fair to say it is a sin to wish for immortality. 
but you cover the art world, and in art, it's exactly the opposite, isn't it? Sure, the, uh, you know, artists are secular, uh, uh, practical, hands-on people, and they don't have any phobias about whether it's a sin to wish for immortality. They all want to be immortal. They want to leave behind them significant works that people will someday admire, and you say, you know, wow, you know, what an amazing painter he was. Well, I don't wish it on you anytime soon, to be sure, <laughs> but you have left behind a lot of good stuff. Yes. So thank you. We can be happy about that, right? <laughs> I hope so. Regardless of how old you are. All right. <laughs> Gary, it's so good of you to come in and visit us at TVO. Uh, it was a again. pleasure, Appreciate Steve. It. Yeah, it was a pleasure.